Hi everyone, uh, this is Michael Yan and my focus this past summer has been on the identification and isolation of A-beta-42 peptides in Drosophila melanogaster affected with Alzheimer's disease. So a basic background before I get into things, uh, Alzheimer's is a disease that is neurological and is the most prevalent form of senile dementia in humans. And according to an article accepted into the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Neuroscience, it is diagnosed by the presence of neurotic plaques composed mainly of A-beta peptides and neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, Alzheimer's is a daunting condition that has no real cure or way to prevent it. And according to Terriot and Wimblett, has increased in the general population of 85 year olds and up from 6% to 30% in the last 65 years. So to quote Dr. Richardson and Sun Tzu, for us to defeat the enemy, we must know the enemy. So in our study over this past summer, we've been attempting to isolate these A-beta-42 peptides that are the precursor to these insoluble plaques that cause Alzheimer's, as well as the tubulin that forms microtubules and its association with tau proteins. So we've chosen Drosophila melanogaster as our model due to their quick reproduction rate as well as simple genetic structure that allows us to see these peptides and document them, which you'll be seeing later on in this presentation. So these A-beta-42 peptides are formed by the cleaving of the amyloid precursor protein, or APP, at the beta and gamma sites by the base protease enzyme. They then form into monomers, then oligomers, then finally form to aggregate into plaques that later cause the neuronal loss in Alzheimer's. Neurofibrillary tangles are created from microtubules that have disintegrated into tau aggregates, which are misfolded tau proteins that accumulate and form our end product. In the end, these tangles lead to disorganization within the brain cells, as these tau proteins can't function the same and instead uh, begin to disrupt how brain cells communicate with other cells. These tau proteins and microtubules are formed partly by tubulin proteins, which is what we are looking for in our Western blot assay to determine if AD and ELA flies have differing concentrations of tubulin. Um, our two experimental groups were the Alzheimer's flies and our ELOV control flies. The first image here shows our little DYI project using a cassette and two razor blades, making it so that we can fix 12 fly heads, six for the AD group and six for the ELOV group, and have them so that the orientation is the same for each fly head, with each having both eyes facing up. Uh, this ended up helping a lot since a lot of our previous slides had our samples having different orientations, making it harder to compare and make any judgments. And then to begin our embedding process, we first had to fix the samples in a pair of formaldehyde fixative overnight. This process helps to preserve the tissue by ending all biochemical reactions going on and increasing the tissue's mechanical strength and stability. After this fixation was completed, we began our embedding process, which would take the sample through multiple rounds of dehydration, using ethanol, followed by a submission into two changes of toluene before being left in melted paraffin for the night. And then by the next day, the samples are ready to be prepared and sectioned using that gray machine in the third image, just up here. Um, after the sectioning was complete, we would hope to get around 8 to 15 slides from each group of AD and ELOV groups and we'd go through each of these slides and select the best to go forward with our staining procedures. So from the selected slides, around 25% of those would go through the hematoxylin aosin staining protocol, or H&E, and the rest of them would go through our primary antibody staining protocol, both of which we revised from Dr. Parker's lab. That's what you can see there in the first image uh, with all the slide cases. The majority of those would be for the H&E protocol involving the clearing, dehydration, rehydration, and actual staining of the slides, but we'd also use these cases to de-paraffinize the slides we isolated for the primary antibody staining. The primary antibody staining involved using a primary antibody in our lab, either DSHB4A1 to isolate alpha tubulin, or Invitrogen's monoclonal antibody 7M22 to isolate the beta amyloids, as well as a combination of secondary antibodies to bind to the primary antibody to better isolate and highlight their presence in our final product. The fluorescent staining was a part that we added in pretty recently, but we've already seen some promising results that you'll see later in these slides, 
reuse the fluorescence to better highlight the differences between our ELOV fly samples and our AD samples. And then finally, the Western blot assay was done through isolating the protein, undergoing a BCA analysis to quantify protein concentrations in each sample group, then running gel electrophoresis until we could transfer the protein gel to a membrane. Then, finally using a primary antibody staining procedure, we could try and find our protein signals that we were hoping to find. So these are some of our preliminary results. Uh, this is from the HNE staining. On the left in figure J is our Alzheimer sample and figure K is our ELOV sample. The purpose of HNE staining isn't really to isolate specific proteins, but to show the nuclear detail in the cells themselves. Uh, we primarily use the H and E staining to show contrast within the sample and to see our sections as well, as well as the counter stain after the uh, completion of the primary secondary antibody stainings so that they stand out more as well. From here though, in these slides, you can already see sort of those protein aggregates in the Alzheimer's sample marked by the arrowheads, but they, they don't show up as dominantly in the ELOV group but it can't be said for certain what those are since h &E doesn't attach itself to any specific antigens within the sample. Um, that's more focused in these primary antibody staining slides over here uh, that really begin to highlight those specific proteins and aggregates that we were hoping to find. Uh, so these top two figures A and B were our Alzheimer's flies and our bottom two figures C and D were our ELOV control flies. Uh, all four of these samples were stained with the same 7M22 primary antibody targeting A beta peptide specifically. Um, it's important to note also that figures A, C, and D were all counter stained with the H and E staining, which is why they show as the same color as those samples from the previous slide, while figure B was left as is, and that's the natural color of the secondary antibody HRP, which is the reasoning for that brownish color that's highlighted in those aggregates. But you can see between figures A, B, and C, D that the A, D group has multiple areas where these peptides show and they're marked with the arrowheads that aren't seen in the control group. You can also see uh, with those uh, green symbols on those a, uh, figures A and D, uh, and I'll explain this more later, but the A, D Alzheimer's flies, uh, we predict them to uh, deteriorate more morphologically so you can see in figure A that those photoreceptors are a little more disorganized and uh, disoriented compared to the ELOV group in figure D. And I'll explain that more on a later slide. So these slides were from our negative control stains, which don't include any primary antibody staining, but did include the secondary antibodies. These results, we show that there is a difference between our positive experimental group and our negative control since these sections were taken from the same slide and individually selected to undergo the same staining procedures, just minus the primary antibody step. However, I chose these out specifically to represent this slide because, like I said before, to point out the morphological differences between the AD and ELOV brains that we hope to replicate in our own stainings. Uh, supposedly, like I said, Alzheimer's is supposed to deteriorate brains more so that the sections are less distinct and you can see that in the comparison between figures E and F to G, and E and F looks like the brain is one connected section, while figure G looks to still have those individual sections separating the brain. Uh, like I said before, you can also see it in the photoreceptor deterioration. The ELOV flies in figure G have a much more connected and organized photoreceptors, while figures E and F are much more deteriorated but I would like to put a little side note that I'm not gonna draw any solid conclusions from our slides because uh, we're not sure whether these air bubbles and uh, clear gaps in between the sample is caused by Alzheimer's or in our own protocol or sectioning methodology. Um, these slides uh, show another one of our primary antibody staining groups except these slides were treated with the alkaline phosphatase secondary antibody, which allows the slide to show up as this purple color. Again, we have the AD slide on the left labeled as figure H, and the ELOV slide on the right labeled as figure I. Again, like in the other slide regarding the primary antibody staining, I've highlighted these areas of interest with arrows to show where the staining picked up on those aggregates that you can see in the AD group, but 
not really any areas of interest in the ELOV group. And you can also again see that sort of morphological difference that I mentioned in the previous slide where the ELOV group looks much more intact than the AD group but sadly once again we can't signal that out for sure until we replicate more samples and solidify our processing. So these are the fluorescence stains that I mentioned before. Uh, we use these as, to try another visualization because H&E staining is not as sensitive to the signals that we're looking for. Uh, the primary antibody in these is the same, but the secondary antibody is directly conjugated to fluorescent molecule CY3. These are just some of the preliminary results that we've gotten. I believe that these slides aren't really representative of our findings either due to the possibility that the exposure of the camera may have changed between changing slides. So I won't say anything regarding results about these until I can complete more reliable and precise imaging. But you can already see that due to the fluorescence that you can distinguish signals a lot easier than compared to the HNE or the just regular primary antibody staining. So hopefully we get to get more of these in the future. Um, we'll be working on this a lot more. Fluorescence staining is much easier to distinguish uh, between the AD and the ELOV sample, so you know, we're really interested for Sorry. Um, these are the results from the Western blot assay that we ran on the left in figure N. You can see the alpha tubulin markings, which are present and pointed out by the arrows. We know that tubulins are necessary in the development of microtubules, so in this case we're using them as a benchmark or a control when viewing these results, since obviously both AD and ELOV group should contain tubulin within their respective wells. The figure on the right consists of the same blot as the left, which is now under, but this has now undergone an antibody staining, which was left overnight to develop, and we hypothesize that the signal that's pointed out by the arrow is actually a signal for the A-beta peptide we're looking for. We're not certain on that being the case, that's only a working theory for now, but hopefully we can replicate this soon as well and try to get an update on that as soon as possible. So in conclusion, uh, from our staining that's been done, both primary secondary antibody staining as well as hematoxylin and aosin staining has shown us the presence of A-beta-42 peptides in fruit fly samples affected with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the primary antibody staining in particular when counterstained with HNE for morphological contrast, has shown to have very concise results in images for peptide aggregates in the AD samples that are not seen in the ELOV control samples. Thankfully, the presence of these images show that our protocol shows promise and that we can obtain results, but our plans for the future are to better refine this protocol so we can collect samples at a much more efficient and reliable rate. I hope that in doing this, we can decrease the amount of air bubbles that form in our sample and further preserve the sample until staining takes place. Along with this refining of the protocol, we'll try to isolate the correct combination of primary secondary antibody staining to best highlight the contrast and identification of specific A-beta-42 peptides. So far this summer, we have used two different primary antibodies as well as three different secondary antibodies and have attempted most combinations, but there are other antibodies that we have looked at and hopefully can run a couple stains with in the future. Hopefully, we can get some better results out of those and see some better images from them. Until then, we can only gather more data with what we have now and the protocols that we've been revising and continue to try and standardize things from here on out. Uh, these are the acknowledgements. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dakota and Sasha. They're my co-authors. They've helped me gather a lot of data this past summer and help refine our protocols. Uh, Dr. Lin as our primary investigator, always helping us in the lab and answering questions. I'd like to thank uh, Coastal Carolina University and the Gupta College of Science for letting us uh, work in the building all summer, as well as the SC SCORE program uh, with providing us with funding and Dr. Wakefield for coordinating everything. And then these are the references I had. Thank you.